Hey folks, thank you for tuning in to our latest episode of Vinyl and Vision, episode number seven. Uh, my guest tonight is a very good friend of mine and former bandmate, James Toomey. He is currently part of a band called Umbrella Co. Um, we had so many technical difficulties recording this episode uh, a few nights ago that uh, I've decided to cut this uh, video very short. Uh, it's basically half of the length of the full interview. So I would recommend you go to the audio stream to hear the entire uh, interview as well as uh, the entire audio for the record we're featuring tonight, which was Sunny Day Real Estate's Diary. It's the uh, 2009 remastered version, so it actually has two uh, bonus tracks at the end as, as well. <clears throat> um, a lot of problems that we had. James has been a real great sport. I'd like to thank him again for you know sitting down with me and, and doing the show. And uh, yeah, I, I encourage you to go to the audio stream, find it anywhere on any uh, podcast platform, iTunes, Stitcher, uh, SoundCloud, and anything else you search will probably be there. Um, we had a really interesting conversation, especially near the end of our interview, but it got cut short because of the difficulties with my, my uh, computer. Um, on the audio stream, you'll hear me mention if you want to continue that conversation, by all means, feel free to message us or you know, leave comments uh, in the comment section of the YouTube channel here. Uh, links to everything will be posted into the um, the main page there on the audio stream or on the video stream. Links to his band, his uh, current job at Blackstone Valley Tourism Council, um, and anything else that he wanted to promote. It's uh, also going to be up there. Okay. Thank you again for tuning in. tuning in to the latest episode, uh, episode 7 of Vinyl and Vision. I'm your host, Jimmy Drab. I have my guest tonight is James Toomey. Hi, everyone. James Toomey is a Providence resident and a musician in the area. And uh, I don't know what the t official title is of yours at your job. I am the director of marketing at Blackstone Valley Tours. Cool. Yeah, because I, uh, I knew Blackstone Valley Tours, so I just didn't know what the title was exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's cool. So what does that, that entail? Because I don't really know much about it myself. There's a lot of different uh, elements to that. Uh, well, I guess first off, we're a relatively small office, so there's a lot of responsibilities that kind of fall um, to that position. But our organization is uh, for a nonprofit that um, you know, one, one part is promotion of the northern part of Rhode Island, known as Blackstone Valley. Mm -hmm. um, so it's to drive tourism to the area, to our attractions, restaurants, historic sites. And, um, you know, in addition to that, we uh, do a lot of community development. Uh, the organization started in 1985. And uh, at that time, Blackstone Valley was a, a like, very post-industrial area and there wasn't a necessarily like a lot of um, touristy things there you know it mm -hmm. had a lot of history and, and culture um, it's the birthplace of the American Industrial Revolution uh, which is basically mm -hmm. the birthplace of America's economic freedom from England um, yeah. so like essentially America wouldn't exist uh, if it wasn't for right this part of Rhode Island um, yeah so. Yeah, uh, basically showing off kind of how much more it has to offer than what people might think of it. Because, like, uh, I know compared to the, the most popular city in the, in the state, uh, Providence. Yeah, yeah. Providence and Pawtucket have both gone through some pretty significant uh, revitalizations and uh, even the Renaissance, if, uh, if that's what you kind of go so far as to say that. Um, and, uh, yeah, the, the northern parts of the state, which would be, um, what's the... I don't want to say Coventry, that's my neighbor over here. <laughs> Cumberland. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, Central Falls, uh, Woonsocket. Exactly. Yeah. Those three yeah. major cities, or? Uh, well, there's Black Sun Valley in Rhode Island is nine cities and towns. So right. Yeah, Pawtucket to Burrville is basically kind of like the northwest corner. Oh, um, okay. It is. It's a yeah. It's definitely a. And you cover um, all of that. that we do. That yeah. So it's it's kind state. of a unique. A unique challenge, so to say. So mm -hmm. we do have the three uh, lowest uh, income cities in the state, which are Woonsocket, Central Falls, and Pawtucket. Right. Um, but and there are these densely populated, like um, like rich historic and like cultural centers. You know, like um, personally, I love Central Falls. It's probably one of my just favorite places. Like the food. The food scene in Central Falls is absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. um, there's like uh, just so many authentic restaurants from uh, from Colombian to um, Venezuelan and Dominican and yeah. uh, really good Portuguese there because uh, it's like immigrant families that right. live there. It's authentic, um, right? Like, truly authentic. You know, mm -hmm. like I mean. Uh, I go into El Paisa, and I don't speak Spanish, but I, and I feel a little bit weird being in there because I don't speak Spanish. Because you know? everyone else there, uh, everyone is, is speaking <laughs> Spanish, and uh, but the food is phenomenal. Um, so you know we have those types of places, but then that's also matched with these like just kind of sprawling rural areas where in right. Gloucester we have like equestrian farms and uh, just a lot of open space and. Mm -hmm. You know, a maple farm and uh, you know vegetable farms and meat farm, like just these big areas and antiquing and these sort of like quintessential New England villages where, um, yeah, you can go antiquing and get a coffee or go to like a winery. So mm -hmm. um, there's a lot to to offer, uh, a lot to come see. We have a lot to offer up there. So mm. um, yeah, just trying to help get the word out and, and letting people know that that. You know, even if you are in Providence, that a very short drive, you know, I'm okay. talking about like 15, 20 minutes yeah. from Providence, <laughs> you could be at this uh, like rustic winery. Um, yeah, that sounds great. I mean, you know, we, we should take advantage of living in the smallest state. Yeah. You know, yeah. we have the, the shortest commutes of anyone in any other state, basically. You know, yeah, but it is odd because a lot of people will, will never go to Burrville because they're like, oh, that's way too far, you know. Yeah. Well, that's a good <laughs> idea that, that you mentioned that, you know, kind of just uh, bringing more attention to it because I don't think that most people, most people here, like I, now I've spent a lot of my time in Warwick and here, living here in West Warwick, <clears throat> I'm spending more of my time in this section of the state now. I actually seldom even go to Providence now, mm -hmm. you know, so it's like, it's just, for some reason, it's that weird uh, part of our, our personalities in, in Rhode Island where we just, we just hunker down in our little sections of the state. <laughs> In our little circles, yeah. you know. Yeah. But uh, you know, I do love going out to new places and checking new things out. And with, with what you're saying, it sounds actually pretty fun and interesting to just go and explore those sections of the state that I never go through. You yeah. Know, it's minus like just maybe highway blasting through it to get to wherever else. But you know, I mean, it, it's it's about kind of uh, appreciating where you live and how much more there is around you because I think most people live like that, right? Like most people in any other major city probably have the same feeling where it's just like, hey, you might live in New York City, but you're still only kind of staying within the same, you never leave the island type thing. Yeah, I mean, you know? there's some people with that particular example that never even leave their borough yeah. or leave their neighborhood. Right, you know? <laughs> which so. New York it kind of makes sense because everything is so yeah. condensed. Yeah. But, uh, but at the same time, I mean, like other cities that are you know kind of surrounded by more like uh, rural terrain than than that. Yes. Yeah. Way too urban, really, for an example. But uh, you know, it's just comfort little thing. You know, mm -hmm. people don't like to leave their little comfort zones. I don't think. Uh, yeah, I don't, uh, I'm not sure. I mean, it, but with that, if, if people do want to just discover something, then they don't even have to travel that far. Exactly. You know that there's right. probably a lot of stuff that. Um, just isn't top of mind, but right. Yeah, I yeah. Mean, so you just got to bring that, that attention. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Because so. I saw that video, like the little clip that you guys were working on for the uh, um, uh, highlighting some of the the food choices in the. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Looks so good. Yeah, I, I definitely do want to go <laughs> up there. Yeah. yeah, there's a ton of stuff. Um, 
so yeah, I mean, if it's all right, like to, to plug it, but our website is tourblackstone. Yeah. Dot com, tourblackstone.com and if you go there um, you know things are broken up by activities and then into like kind of a um, you know subcategories from where you go biking so we have our bike path uh, the Blackstone River Bikeway um, mm -hmm. that runs from Woonsocket to Cumberland off-road and then there's on-road connection that runs all the way to the Massachusetts border to Providence um, great mountain biking uh, but anyway like you can break all that stuff down and filter it and all the food is broken into different styles and the different cities, so you can search all that stuff out. And, um, and there's just a ton of events that are going on there. Um, yeah, you posted so. a few of them actually already, like, were pretty interesting. Uh, like, you guys did that dot air uh, festival, yeah. which yeah. is pretty amazing. Yeah, it was a, a really great experience. Uh, I got to work very closely with the folks at Machines with Magnets, um, like, most specifically Willa when she was there. And Marcel when he was there and it was just really fun I mean it was um, just trying to create something from the ground up and uh, do something uh, different each year it was definitely not the easiest route uh, as I'm sure that like Willa and Marcel will agree with that I'm just trying to bring this festival into a different section of Pawtucket and then that area be the inspiration for the artists and for the, the type of aesthetic and all these other things that kind of went on. So it wasn't your typical, like, all right, we're going to take over this field that usually has a festival and put up a stage and put in a, bring in a sound system and we're good to go. I was like, mm -hmm. we're going to go under this bridge. We're going to go on top of this parking garage, in this parking garage, you know, like right. different stuff like that. So, um, yeah, it was really fun. Yeah, well, that's great. And it, it, it sounds like it's a good timing, too, because uh, especially with that, with, you know, um, the art scene becoming more prevalent in that city and that surrounding area, <clears throat> you're, you know, obviously Providence is a disaster for, for you know, low-income people, like, you know, the artist guys that are mm -hmm. struggling to, to make some money uh, to just, you know, afford their rents. Yeah. So they're going to probably be looking up into that, those neighborhoods now, which is great. And, yeah, uh, yeah, you've kind of you've seen that of just trying to have, you know, live work spaces. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Pawtucket was at the forefront of that with this this gentleman Morris Nathanson, who's like an artist that came to the area and was you know a big advocate for having like the live work, um, mm -hmm. like mill spaces, you know, decades ago. So um, it's always been uh, they've always kind of been a leader at that. But yeah, they're providing that same thing with Central Falls. Um, they just kind of there's artists that are moving in, into those spaces so it's I mean uh, uh, you know people have kind of commented on it that you know Pawtucket and Central Falls are kind of like the Brooklyn of uh, of our state where you know like that's mm -hmm. where artists are. so maybe that might not be the best thing as people are not able to live in Brooklyn anymore but uh, you know um, but yeah it kind of has that vibe and uh, yeah man sounds great um, I'll link it for you actually like I don't mind you mentioning it at all or cool. anything like that I mean if it's part of what you do it's part of who you are and that's yeah, yeah. completely fine with me man. Um, nothing, another thing I wanted to touch on was the band that you're in now um, sure came as kind of a surprise that I saw that you, you joined them because I, I, I assumed you were so busy with the whole doing this job obviously and then having children and being married yeah that definitely puts a, puts a strain on trying to do the, the try to do the work music wise you know? yeah yeah so um, yeah, tell me about them. Sure. Yeah. Uh, no, it's it's been great. I've started playing in a new band called Umbrella Co. Uh, the band has existed for um, for a little bit. I mean, it's you know a relatively new band, or especially um, here in Rhode Island. There's not uh, they haven't played like a ton of shows before I um, connected with them, but yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, not to backtrack too much, but yeah, I've played in a lot of bands and then did take some time off, but just felt, I don't know, I just kind of wanted to connect with some, some new people. Um, so I, I still sit in with uh, other bands uh, that I've played with, but um, connecting with Umbrella Co has been, um, been fun to just um, learn some new songs, play some, different styles so it's more like the 
I don't know. I mean, every, what does is, what is indie rock mean, I guess? But uh, uh, it, I don't know how to really describe it. I mean, there's yeah. a lot of different influences from like Radiohead and, and those types of bands, I guess. But Right. Um, well, I think the word that we're going to be using tonight a lot is going to be emo and the very different genres of that. Yeah, yeah, okay. You know, the different subcategories of that genre. Yeah. Um, because uh, tonight we're going to be featuring Sunny Day Real Estate's Diary. Um, and uh, I've been doing a little bit of research about that band because I just, I actually don't really know much about them at all. Mm -hmm. But it sounds actually now, having listened to that uh, on re repeat for a little while and then listening to your band uh, through the Bandcamp website, which I can link that as well. Sure. Um, well yeah, yeah, there's definitely similarity there. Mm -hmm. um, it's obviously a little different. It's obviously, I mean, your different bands or whatever, but uh, just kind of within the same vein, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it, so I, I mean, it's just been cool. I mean, uh, getting to connect the bass player Chris, uh, it's, I've just enjoyed kind of hanging out with these guys to be honest. Uh, like, so Chris, ironically, or coincidentally, uh, writes a travel blog called Lil Pines, L-I-L Pines, um, mm -hmm. and he's like stayed on the riverboat that like, that Blackstone Valley Tourism owns like so we have this english canal boat that we rent out as like a bed and breakfast and he's like stayed on it you know mm -hmm. and wrote written a blog about it so um just kind of connecting with him on that on like his travels which are very much um the unique um places like the very uh like blackstone valley kind of places of just like off the beaten path yeah um you know staying in lighthouses and you uh -huh. know, checking out like fire towers and stuff so um his his uh, travel uh, site is is great, but just like getting to know him a little bit more and just kind of connecting with that. He's played in bands for a long time. He was in Broadcaster. Um, he was in some other bands around here and, and um, uh, playing a lot in the area and up in Boston. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just been really cool to just connect with him and, and John, who's the singer and songwriter, um, is somewhat of a recent transplant from Chicago. Um, oh, extremely. Okay. Awesome guy, really nice guy to um, just hang out with, and I don't know. It's it's just been kind of fun of just building that relationship and just kind of starting something new. Yeah. Um, learning how to write songs with some new people, trying to kind of break away from the same tendencies that I might make as a drummer. Um, just oh, yeah. trying to push myself into that hmm. in that way. Um, yeah. That's interesting because. I find I find you to be one of the most like um, kind of like tactical drummers that I know. Like you're, you're just you're a great drummer, like hands down, cool. the best I've ever played with. And um, I always I was always uh, admired your your like um, kind of creativeness with it. That uh, like uh, the, just the little things that you would do, like you know with the uh, what was the little metal chain on your cymbals for that uh, tremolo effect. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. Right. <laughs> Metal chains on. Uh, yeah, on yeah. Sounds. But I mean, it's just like that—that that kind of organic, like way to experiment with sound and, and you know, yeah. kind of test the realms of possibilities with your instrument. You yeah. Know? So I've always respected that. To say that you're trying to do that more now, <laughs> I'm like, okay, that's that's pretty cool. I definitely want to hear what you're doing. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. I guess there's just always been that ambition to just keep keep learning and keep trying new stuff and mm -hmm. um, I don't know I mean so it's not like I'm completely changing genres or something like that but yeah. um, you know with what uh, they're uh, you know like what they're looking for like John's influences or you know he's very big into like English pop stuff and some things that I've just to be honest, I'm not as familiar with, so just trying to get more acquainted with that or trying to kind of meld those sounds where, where yeah, I am, uh, you know, a self-taught drummer that is very much in the, you know, started as the Dave Grohl, William Goldsmith, you know, like, just like, mm -hmm. I'm going to play these things as hard as I can, 
Yeah. Um, and just like and playing along with your headphones, like the you know yeah. bands that you wanted to just like yeah. kind of idolize or whatever. Exactly. Kind of learn from that. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, so trying to get those things to to kind of mash up and um, and again, Chris has done a ton of just like program um, like drum program and, and beats and just a lot of like more like some has some experience with some more electronic sound so mm -hmm. I don't know just trying to bring all these kind of things yeah. together right um, so the the recording you guys had on Bandcamp it's a like three song EP yeah. right now did you record on that no you did? no okay. no that was um, already recorded um, but their uh, drummer moved to Ohio um, and that was just kind of how I connect with them it was just um, you kind of just, and... yeah just kind of like searching I was like anyone need a drummer and this came up and um, listened to it and liked it and reached yeah. out and just said hey you know so are you guys working on new songs now together yeah I mean we've got uh, you know a handful of songs that uh, that we've been playing live so kind of where we're at now is just trying to kind of pare those down to you know a small smaller handful um, that we'll focus on for uh, recording and then just kind of fine-tuning them mm -hmm. so um, a lot of what we were, were doing was just kind of getting them ready to play live like getting them like all right we've learned this here's the you know verse course verse type thing but like Flesh them out. Um, yeah, exactly. Just trying to get the sound there, and um, so yeah, that's where we're at right now. Um, we're looking to hopefully record soon, like in the you know next few months. Um, got a couple more songs done, and um, and then see how we can put them out. You know. Yeah. So, cool. Yeah. Maybe get some vinyl press. Maybe. Yeah, I mean we've kind of talked about that. Um, just looking at different uh, different ways to go about that um, mm. so yeah I don't know I think it'd be kind of cool to do like a seven inch or yeah you'd like to do a split with someone um, so yeah if any bands out there are interested yeah if anyone yeah. wants to do it um, let yeah. us know um, I'll, I'll, I'll link your band's band camp and then that way people can listen to it stream and kind of see what it sounds like yeah obviously it's gonna be different because you are not playing on that recording and you guys are working on new material which is good but uh, you know it's, that's ballpark idea yeah it's around there it won't be too too much different but um, yeah but yeah just doing that and then um just playing some shows so mm -hmm. that's definitely been uh eye-opening slash fun slash not fun of <laughs> um just starting to book more shows um yeah. it, it definitely has this like uh been I've been lucky uh, to play with the bands I've played played in. So, um, you know, getting to play in Barn Burning. Anthony, uh, I love Anthony. Uh, he's such a, I don't know, just a strong, strong person. But he would just mm -hmm. continue to always push the band and just yeah. be booking these shows. And, for better um, or for worse, yeah. Yeah, you know, but he'd just always be like booking these shows and he'd be like, can you do this show? And right. um, same thing uh, with Mark from Sharks and Cruising. He just, be like, we're doing these shows. And, um, you know, so with this, like, more of it is uh, just, it, it's like a do, you know? Like, so I can, you know, still reach out to those people and, and try to set up some shows. Do, you know, in a, a sense, I do kind of like this being like again somewhat of a, a newer thing for me that it's can kind of stand on its own mm -hmm. um, but there is that like level of like who are you like what you know I've never yeah. heard of, I've never heard of your band before like what you know like right. where um, I mean barn burning has been a band for I mean, it's coming up on 20 years basically yeah pretty soon um, so, so uh, you know whether you like them or or hate them, you've probably at least heard heard yeah. the name well, of the I band, mean, you know. So. Yeah, if you're from Rhode Island, most more more likely. Um, but I mean, you know, you gotta start somewhere, yeah. and so I mean, from what you're saying, like, what are the names of your are the members of your band? Jay, uh, John, John, and Chris, Chris. Yeah. Okay, 
So, I mean, these guys started, what, a year ago? Um, they, I mean, uh, well, there was another member, Harrison, that uh, connected with John together, and they did a lot of the writing, but that was a few years ago. Um, okay. And then the, um, the bass player before Chris was Keith, who's now in 123 Astronaut. Um, oh, okay. So uh, they had done some of that recording, but, you know, this EP came out the beginning of last year. So um, hmm. they had been recording. I think that they really only played like one show in Providence. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, you know, it's. Yeah, it'll take time. Uh, yeah, yeah. Once you get a record out, and then next thing you know, yeah, it won't be so, it won't seem so strange. You can say your, your band's name, be like, oh, that's right, yeah, I heard you guys. Yeah. You guys are playing the other night, right? <laughs> yeah. all the time. <laughs> yeah. By the, by the way, speaking of which, uh, when, when are you playing again? Uh, we have a show at, at the News Cafe on April 6th. Um, uh, not exactly sure if the Wells is on. Yeah, that's a ways of ways still, a couple months. Yeah, uh, yeah, I guess so, about a yeah, month and a half or so. So, um, yeah, that's the next Umbrella Co. show. Um, I am going to be sitting in with Sharks, come cruising on a couple shows in March. Uh, St. Patrick's Day? Yeah, I'm doing the St. Patrick's Day show. And uh, a week prior to that, we're doing a show with the Tossers at Askew, which is on March 10th. Um, mm. I'm so excited about that. Cool, man. Um, they're such a great band. And so, yeah, the Tossers on the Pullman and, and Sharks come cruising. Um, so, yeah. yeah it's always like fun get back with those guys there. It's really fun to play with. Um, yeah. So. Cool, man. That sounds great. Well, um, so we should get into this record. Let's um, do it. Yeah. Let me give it to you. Let me give it to you so you can look it over. Uh, I didn't I didn't warn you that this is the 2009 reissue. Okay. Are you familiar? I just uh, know that they bought a couple other a couple other tracks. A couple bonus tracks, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's all, I mean, it's remastered. It's double vinyl. So yep. we've got two records to get through tonight. All right. Um, it's not that much longer than your typical record. It's just over the span it's of two, cool, two albums. Yeah. Did, have you owned a copy of this before? No, not on vinyl, no. Oh, have you just a uh, CD before? Yeah, CD yeah, I think two? I just, yeah, burned it from someone, to be honest. Sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Sub Pop, but, uh, no, that's all right. Um, cause, so what, what's your history with this band like? Because um, this was released in 1994 originally. Yeah, yeah. So were you, you were around 14 when this came out? Yes. Okay. You know a lot about me. Yeah. <laughs> well, I just, I, I just knew that we were the same age. Yeah. So yeah. that makes it easier for me to do that. <laughs> if you were just a year or so behind or forward, I would just, I don't know, how old were you? Yeah. Six, six years old? <laughs> yeah. I look at these guys. Yeah, you may, yeah. may have been yeah. six when you bought this. I don't know, but um, so fourteen. Did you like hear about this when it came out or no? No. Hit you um, a little later. Yeah. Um, my introduction to it was. Um, so yeah, about that time, about like when I was thirteen, fourteen or so. Um, there was this kid in high school, Jeff Nadick, that made me a cassette that had the Get Up Kids four minute mile on it. Okay. And, um, and they gave me like separate the magnets from grade and yeah, four minute mile from the Get Up Kids like just really hit with me, you know, yeah. so I guess. That was a pretty legendary like emo rock record. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I just listened to that all the time, and it, it just uh, just connected with it, and it became uh, uh, what I could, I don't know, kind of, I don't know, call my own in, in some sense, or just at that seminal time of growing up, yeah. um, you know, breaking away from your parents or any of that other kind of stuff, or just trying to um, find your own. So... Yeah, I just listened to that a lot, and kind of at that same time, I started started to play music, and one of my bandmates was um, 
to this guy, Andy Jones, and he just knew that I listened to this Ghetto Kids record all the time and like listened to that type of stuff. And he's like, dude, you gotta check out Sunny Day Real Estate. Like, really? if you like this stuff, you have to, you have to listen to Sunny Day. So, um, yeah, he was the guy that, that passed this along and, um, you know, he was the big advocate for, for Diary. Yeah, it seems uh, from the research that I that I have done, uh, the interviews that I've listened to, and the reading that I've done to try to kind of bone up on this, um, it seems like ever since this record came out, and it seems like ever since it came out, not like you know years down the road, it became one of those records where it's just like, hey, oh yeah, you you know about this band, you're you're gonna want to hear about them, mm-hmm. like you're gonna want to listen to this record, and like this one especially, yeah, uh, this being their debut record. Uh, which is kind of pretty amazing to be in a band and have your debut record be like one of the most like seminal pieces of work in the genre that it's part of, you know? Yeah. Um, but uh, to be honest with you, I really, I really didn't know anything about this record yeah. before you chose it, and um, I never really wanted to. Yeah. So, what do you mean? Like you didn't want like you're just when I was fourteen. Um, I was getting into music as well, but the, the type of music that I was into was not like this at all. Mm-hmm. I mean, not completely. I mean, there was the whole grunge thing that was happening, and obviously Nirvana was a big uh, influence, and, and I listened to them, you know, uh, endlessly at that time. But um, I also the other bigger band that I that I listened to a lot at that time was the Red Chili Peppers, because mm-hmm. uh, I have older brothers and they influenced me kind of uh, sometimes. Not not so terribly, but sometimes it was just like questionable. <laughs> yeah, like some of the stuff they were getting into, and obviously I was you know uh, exposed to it as well, and a lot of it stuck. And um, I don't know, it, it just I, I didn't even like listen to this record like then, but I just knew I didn't want to have anything to do with it. Like I remember like he, maybe hearing like a little snippet of it, like maybe like catching clips of the videos and, and the songs from like 120 minute, minutes or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and that was pretty much it. And I was just like, yeah, I don't know, I don't want to listen to that band. And uh, so it took me a while before I got into like anything that was along the same lines of like emo, mm-hmm. emo music in general, like kind of hardcore or emo core or whatever you want to call it. Um, all that stuff, the indie alternative, which it, I guess, has morphed into since. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, like the Get Up Kids and Braid and the Promise Ring were all bands that I had heard about and I was kind of interested in and I was just like, yeah, you know, I'll listen to it eventually. And eventually it was only like 10 years ago or something. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, it seems like if it's not your, not your thing, it can be easy for it to not be. Like there, um, I mean, just one element, like Jeremy's voice is not a typical mm. singing voice, you know, so yeah. it's like so recognizable and um, I mean even just the ones that you just listed like especially Davey from The Promise Ring, <laughs> like, mm-hmm. um, you know, it, it almost kind of seems that uh, that evolution to this um, to this wave of emo, um, like Jeremy kind of opened the door for that like you don't have to have your typical like um, music school um, uh, singing voice to, to be in this band that there was just that like you know, rawness um, you know so yeah Promise Ring and, and Piebald I mean Travis oh, Piebald, that's not you know there's like some of that stuff is you know even though I love Piebald some of that stuff is rough you know like <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, later records, I think. Uh, I mean, yeah, yeah, as you know, like, uh, I listened to uh, uh, We're the Only Friends That We Have, like, on Constant when we were on the road together. So That's true. Uh, that was, like, my driving record, so. I've never I owned the rec- that copy of that record, and I don't think I ever need to. Oh, uh, okay. It's stuck <laughs> in my brain at this point. Um, yeah. Uh, so, but, yeah, I mean, it, it, there's, uh, I guess you can kind of see the evolution. Uh, it is kind of a, a unique thing or just uh, maybe just a coincidental thing with um you know sunny day being from from seattle yeah because um, at that time obviously it was just like the big grunge uh, it, it had focus. to work in their favor you know 
I think, well, I would, yeah, I don't know, but I would assume that I was like, it brought attention or um, it brought, um, well, it gave Sub Pop probably some money. Um, so, yeah, one of the uh, one of the things that I saw in my research was that this album uh, was the seventh best selling record on Sub Pop. Yeah, yeah, which is pretty weird. I mean, seventh best. I mean, and and I guess the figure at the time too was uh, two hundred ninety one thousand copies. Yeah, which that's not even. I mean, that's very good for an independent record for sure. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, but. I mean, the gold standard for like the typical uh, for you know the mainstream record industry is uh, what five hundred thousand gold, right? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> but I mean, my he was like selling like ten thousand records is like indie rock gold, you know? Oh so. yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, no. I mean, I would be happy with five thousand. That's yeah. great. <laughs> but uh, I, I guess uh, it was kind of a weird for me to kind of see that and, and kind of try to put that into perspective because. Uh, the whole record sales industry thing it, it really it, it blows my mind. I don't understand it. I just really don't. And you know, for for lack of uh, having any kind of professional career in it in that industry, but um, I don't understand like um, all these different like variants of pressing and stuff like that. Like I don't know how to keep track of all that. Like mm -hmm. especially uh, at that level, or like when you're a company, like a let's say from Sub Pop's perspective. Um, having to press that many records or like and how yeah. many do they press at first and like then there's the whole like okay first second press like first sec second third pressings yeah. of whatever release uh you know on vinyl and then cds and cassettes and it just kind of seems i don't know mind-numbing to think about it yeah but um well just the different side of the, the for the they seem like they're sort of in the middle of the spectrum of things where you might have your Sony records that's like all right we just signed such and such an artist so we need to print you know at the first one a million units of this you know right. <laughs> CD you know they're probably in that that range but yeah the bands I've been in are like so what's the minimum I can order <laughs> right can you yeah. order 25 yeah, of those? yeah. <laughs> that's actually what the Telcade said to me last, last time on yeah. the last episode that they uh, that they ordered the very minimum just because they knew they were going to be releasing the record and they just wanted to have CDs ready for the CD release party. Yeah. But they like had no expectations to like sell any amount of them or, or didn't really want to, I guess, you know, because they you know, they had they have everything online now. It's all digital. Yeah, like, yeah. You know, just buy it off Bandcamp or something, just download it to your device. Yeah. So um yeah, and I and I understand that. You know, it's just like if you don't expect to sell thousands of them, then yeah, I mean, you don't want to keep on holding on to them. Mm -hmm. and, like, I mean, move all these boxes of CDs around endlessly until for how long? You know? Yeah, yeah. So no, I mean, Mark from from Sharks and Cruising has become a a master of that kind of stuff. Where, I mean, he's his own distribution company. <laughs> well, he is, but he's just become very smart. Well, with regard, I mean, he, he is very smart with all, like everything he's done. I mean, he's run that band very, very well, very professionally. It's a, it's a great band to, to play in and have played in. But um, yeah, he's just aware of like, all right, I'm not gonna print so many copies of this thing because I know what, right? Like what our fan base is, and we're gonna sell this many records. So like, actually, they uh, just put out a, uh, a great new record that came out last year. Uh, so they. Did a short run of CDs, but they did um, lathe cut vinyl. Um, so they did, I think, I don't know, maybe like fifty copies or something like that on, on like vinyl. A, um, yeah, on like a double ten inch, like gatefold, um, like really yes. like cool like screen print jackets that um, uh, uh, Paul from Teeth Like Swords printed, and they just did like some really cool stuff. So Mark always does a lot of those types of things of mm -hmm. just doing these short runs um, sort of DIY aesthetic and that yeah. kind of thing so um, that sounds great I didn't realize that he, they had pressed uh, vinyl in time yeah, yeah. Um, that's awesome I'll have to talk to him about that because I, I'd be very interested in kind of knowing how, how you know what the process is like and what he did with it and, you sure know. I'd love to talk to you yeah yeah cool so uh Let's uh, dive into this record because uh, this is might might be a little bit of a lengthy one. All right. Um, when's the last time you listened to this? Uh, this week. 
Yeah. But I mean, I didn't want to get caught off guard, you know. Right. So, like, oh well, yeah, that, you know. Um, well, I mean, how how much did you listen to this like growing up with it? Like, you know, um, like how familiar with it are you? Um, quite familiar, but um, you know, I, I guess we should just get it out of the way since like the first couple of notes have been played. Is that this isn't yeah. my favorite Sunny Day record? You know, oh, it's so, not. No. Oh well, it's the one that I had. What? Oh no, no, and that's that's fine. But I'm just saying that, like, in the you're absolutely right with this being like such a seminal record, and this is what everyone goes to. But like, mm -hmm. I listen to, or my favorite is how it feels to be something on like their mm -hmm. like third album. Um, so that's like my go-to Sunny Day record. Yeah. But, um. But this is such a. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, it is this this. Uh, classic uh, rock record I mean this is classic emo record uh, that uh, I don't know it, it, it seems like it does has has its lineage that you know even just the you know what what I had read um, you know members of this band will cite rights of spring as like here who their influence is and mm -hmm. yet any band that came after Sunday day real estate that it's plays anything like this it's going to be you know they're um, they're like you know either, either they're going to say it or they're going to be disingenuous about like not saying it you know but yeah sunny day <laughs> is there you know like i can't um like listening to williams drumming like um you know whether i like it or not like he's just been a big influence yeah on, now why do you say that do you not like the way he drums or um like when you're in your uh, level of maturing, like as a musician, as a drummer, I mean, do you feel like uh, this was kind of immature to to you at, at that time, at your age, at your young age, and you kind of grew, kind of grew away from it, or no? I guess I just bring it up because I've never like sat with Sunny Day Real Estate and said, "All right, let me learn how to play in circles," you know, like I have with some other bands or some other songs, or like I just want to play this song so um so and yeah just admit that, that it's just sort of been like i've listened to sunny day so much that it's just gonna kind of come in um almost subconsciously into my playing and uh you know he's just a big rock drummer you know yeah um you know i can kind of see again that there since there wasn't a whole lot of this genre beforehand that you know playing in uh, like the hardcore scene as as these guys did um i can kind of pick up on you know william just wanted to like fill that space like he just was like um it almost seemed like he was kind of trying to play like these like punk hardcore songs like slowed down a little bit or like tr like trying to hold back a little bit from what he would normally do um mm -hmm. uh to produce these types of things because there's just a lot of hits like you know it, it, if you notice there's just a lot of snare hits there's a lot of um you know things that he throws in that that are his you know that make his style his style it's but it's just but it's just like that's a lot of a lot of shit you threw in there, you know. It's like you didn't necessarily need to be like, duh, 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 you know, like you're right. just like, yeah. You know. Um, yeah, well, I, you know, I don't have anything to compare it to though, because uh, did he play? You were saying that your favorite uh, Sunny Day record was uh, what is it called again? That, How it feels to be something on. How it feels to be something on, right? Because uh, from the research I was doing, that came up a lot as well, uh, mm -hmm. where you know fans of this band would say just what you did, and that that is probably one of their best records. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I'm not familiar with it though. Actually, I don't think I've ever listened to it. Oh, okay. <clears throat> but um, but I do know that this band has had, had such like, just uh, like they're just a, a, a disaster of a band. Um, yeah. The, the, the personal know. relationships between all of the members has just been like this just hot mess. Yeah. Of you know back and forth like obviously um, loving each other enough to to work together to make this record. And then like falling apart, and then uh, Nate and um, William, yeah. you know, leaving the band. I guess I don't know if I don't, I don't know if they they were intention was to officially leave this band, but and like never come back. But obviously, Will Goldsmith with his 
falling out with Dave Grohl and Foo Fighters mm-hmm. did go back to the band. So did he record, did he play on that record? The third Is record? On, uh, did William play on? Yeah. He did, but Nate did not. Right. Yeah. So, Nate did play on the second record. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, he, yeah, I think Nate's played on all the Sunny Day uh, recordings uh, with the exception of that particular record, and Nate also played on in the Fire Theft. So the Fire mm-hmm. Theft was basically Sunny Day without Dan, who's the other guitar player. Um, oh, okay. But yeah, you're right. They're um, yeah, their personal relationships have been yeah, kind of odd, I guess. Or I don't know. I mean, it's just a good a good. Uh, thing to kind of keep in mind with uh, whatever success kind of comes from and you know um, just what I don't know I guess for me like growing up there was always that um, ambition to 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 be a musician and to I don't know I mean to be a famous musician and just had that um, I've always wanted to tour um, Mm -hmm. but you know getting to actually meet or friends with famous musicians like MTV famous musicians um, or hearing these type of stories like it just doesn't it doesn't always line up you know it's not yeah. this like um, paradise that like you know you're sunny day real estate and you have this you know the number seven you know selling record on sub pop but they just have this relationship that within themselves that they just couldn't um, stay together or they come back together and back away or they'd be like infighting or they'd be you know Mm. this person believes in this particular religion and I can't believe in that so let's like move away and um, just a lot of different stuff you know so um, well I mean I I feel like I've you know on a personal level I've always you know been in any band that I've been in I've been with uh, with people that obviously we're not the same person you know we like we, we share a mutual interest uh, and probably many mutual interests, but at the same time, we're just different people too. We have things that we, we don't have, uh, you know, in common. And, uh, but that's okay. I mean, you make it work with your friends, right? Mm-hmm. I just don't understand this relationship. I don't understand this band and like how, like how weird and like diverse it was between all of them to like, I don't know, just, just even to keep on trying to make it yeah. work. I mean, cause they, well, even I mean, I think it's because they've sold 250,000 copies of this record, you know, yeah. they've sold, you know, right. they, so, I mean, if you kind of, I guess that that's the things that you can kind of weigh out is this, uh, so I've played in bands that aren't, you know, successful in this, in this way at all, you know, so right. nobody's going to care if we break up, um, no one's going to ask us to play a reunion show, like, no one's mm-hmm. going to do all these other things, but, like, if you're Sunday Day Real Estate, or if that's, what you look at doing or, or probably more importantly if that's what you are doing for money mm-hmm. then you need to kind of keep that stuff in the back of your head you know if it's like all right do I want to play in this band and and try to make this stuff work and kind of just hope that the other member has changed enough that we can get on stage right you know cross your fingers um, or do I want to go like work for my uncle's plumbing company or something like that I mean those or like the real life choices that right. um, that that happen all the time. I mean, some of my favorite bands. Like that's literally what they're. You know, they write this classic record and everyone loves it. But like, it's not. They don't sell enough of it for for them to only play music. So they're like working in construction or like right. you know just that uh, um, that thing. You know. So I mean, again, I don't know if that's what it is, but I mean, they probably just try to make that stuff work or try to make it work more with that particular group I know that mm-hmm. the stuff I've heard is that you know Jeremy and William are have just played in bands together forever and they just I think they're just like making music together which is like something yeah. um, to uh, you know that's just a really like uh, understandable and admirable kind of thing of just wanting to always kind of get together um, yeah. and just create um, but again it's just going to be under a different microscope you know like mm-hmm. Jeremy Enoch and, and any of these guys 
they're not going to be able to do anything without it being like Those former guys. former sunny day real estate or the you know right. like even if they try to start some other like small side project it's going to be oh yeah and this is what what william's doing or whatever you know yeah. so well, of course i mean that that <clears throat> shit follows you and, and it kind of has to and it only helps you really as a musician i mean the more um the more success that you've had within a band the better for you in your future career you know i mean like it's like any of any other band like any famous band any band that's disbanded and members have gone on to do solo projects or whatever it's just like usually they're never as successful usually um but at least they have that they have that option to say like okay well i'm gonna do this like you know the most uh, notable example that comes into my mind is like Joe Strummer. Yeah. It's like, and it, it's it's devastating from a fan's perspective because it's just like a guy that was on such a pedestal of being like this iconic like punk legend, mm -hmm. literally a legend. Yeah, yeah. And then that band breaks up and they're, you know, they just go their separate ways and all of them go on to do separate projects and you know, um, and he just was never able to get back to anywhere near that level of like success yeah i mean enough to keep him going i mean but he's he'd be like working at it hard like not on an independent level per se but to be struggling yeah you know i mean like whatever royalties or whatever he's getting from the clash he's getting from the clash fine but he, he wants to be able to still remain uh true to himself and create um eternally <clears throat> but everything that he would put out after that point is just like Eh, you know, it's just kind of sliding under the radar, radar and like, no radio stations want to talk to him, like that type of thing, where it's yeah, just like, yeah. no one wants to talk to him about what he's doing, they all just want to know about what ha what did the Clash do. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's one of those things, I guess, like, that kind of is what happens with fame and, like, celebrity when you're successful at something like, you know, being in a band. It gets, helps you, helps your career, I mean, like, you don't have to go back to the day job, but you have to deal with always living under that shadow. Yeah. For good, for better. Yeah, but I mean, um, you know, I recently saw that there there was a GoFundMe for William. It's because he was gonna sell his drums, and he, because he's like just like out of money. Ugh. You know, so um, so again, you know, you can just look at like this is this iconic drummer that has just influenced people behind him and has you know played everywhere you know like from any any of the clubs coming up with sunny day to giant arenas with foo fighters and mm -hmm. you know now he's at the pedaling his know, instrument now he's trying to yeah like he's getting to that that place so yeah um yeah i don't know i mean i think anyone that's kind of honest about this stuff just knows that when these things hit there really isn't necessarily like rhyme or reason um they're just you know some things right place at the right time and mm. um you know connects with the right people and it kind of spreads spreads that way um but but yeah i mean the i guess the point is just that that's a tricky thing so you could you know hate the other members of your band I'm not saying that Sunny Day does but you can hate the members of your band hate the band that you played in and if you're, you're like famous enough it's you're never going to be able to shake it down you know like yeah. anything else you ever do is just going to be well yeah you run that band can you talk about that you know can you talk about what this is and you know you can never just be yeah I mean it's tough to come up with someone that has like just completely reinvented themselves um, mm. and, and you know kind of moved away from whatever that particular uh, band or yeah. even just genre to just you know stand stand alone. So yeah, um, JT yeah, sounds like the best example of that. Justin Timberlake. Yeah, maybe, but he's still. Like, how many of his fans can even like even recall what did he do before he was just Justin Timberlake? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess yeah. Maybe like Beyonce is just kind of yeah. I think she's elevated. Level past um, Destiny's Child, that was what, that's what she was in for, right? Yeah, Destiny, yeah. yeah. Um, I don't even know pop music, and that, that shit sticks with me. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I guess I'm thinking of, like, is there anyone that... Uh, maybe, uh, like, Rod Stewart, right? He was in 
faces, faces yeah. You know? But to me, I think that that's more like a better example of like, so Rod Stewart is this, this person to me, mm -hmm. you know, like I, you know, can be familiar. And then when I found out that he was in another band before that, I was like, oh. That was way better. <laughs> I was like, oh shit, I didn't realize that. <laughs> He, well, I thought he was just this guy, you know? I thought right. that he was just this singer that kind of came right. up. Right, like that, Billy you know? Joel, right? Yeah. Billy yeah. Joel's been, been Billy Joel. Yeah, exactly. He's never so, been in a, like um, a famous So maybe that's band. more of like, maybe that's a, a good example, but how many Rod Stewart's are out there where you can just say, oh yeah, they did this other thing beforehand that was different, was better, was whatever, yeah. you know? Um, yeah, that is kind of separated where, you know, fans of the different bands would not really connect them. You know, right. So, or at least like the the level of mainstream success that they have, their their like fan base currently doesn't necessarily know or acknowledge what their previous career was like, or like you know yeah. the earlier part of their career. Yeah. Because that was all leading up to where they are now, but some people just don't know what that was. Some people are just like this guy was on MTV. I listened to his videos and he's great. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like yeah. oh, he's playing with. Played at the stadium, we were singing at the stadium. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, for like Justin Timberlake, he was still singing and dancing and you know, like, yeah, you know, singing, choreographed yeah. stuff. So um, yeah, it was if he was in like uh, a gutter punk band before that, then I'd be like, oh, that's sweet. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I'd be like, I used, to, I used to like him when. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, no, he's still just a singing, dancing monkey guy. I don't know. Maybe, <laughs> maybe you want to tell him. I, I don't know. Daryl likes his record. Uh, Justin Timberlake? Yeah. I, I really like Justin Timberlake, yeah. Um, you like his new stuff? I, I haven't listened to the, the last record. Yeah, um, the Man in the Woods thing. Yeah, I didn't listen to that, but no, I do. I think that his, um, I don't know, I think he's really entertaining. Yeah. Um, uh, I really like Slow Jams, as, as you probably know, so he's got some of that on there. Um, mm -hmm. Confessions from Usher is a really fucking good album in my opinion um, if you get if you skip uh, whatever that song is with Lil John the yeah song is like the first one on that but if you get after that yeah um, yeah I dig that kind of stuff but no I, I think uh, Justin Tim Timberlake is really good mm -hmm. um, I mean I don't go out and yeah, run to buy his record the day it comes out or anything like that but um, no, as, as I don't really for anything, even the things that I love. I yeah, still, I still not... wait for like, oh, no, I'll just, just I'll get that like months after the fact, you know. Yeah. I don't need it like as soon as it comes out. Yeah, well, I mean, things are things are different. I mean, I guess that the vinyl resurgence has been kind of cool. I'm definitely a, um, I do like physical albums um, more than like the just the digital thing kind of getting mm -hmm. back to what you're talking about um i mean it's absolutely true even like the umbrella co uh, ep it's it came out digitally you know so it's available everywhere on spotify and Bandcamp and mm -hmm. you know itunes and all that stuff but um nothing was ever like made um, right, right. so i like the made things um mm -hmm. you know with with sharks going back years we had a couple of songs that were left over from our album so we put together a, a cassette single that were all like hand done and covers were all like handmade and stuff like that just so we have um, something you yeah know? and uh, so I also do like the cassette resurgence um, I dig that kind of thing but this was before even that was kind of you know maybe it was at the beginning of that yeah coming up so a lot of people are like I don't have a cassette player dude like well how am I gonna buy this because I'm like it's like two dollars it's like we're selling these cassettes for like <laughs> you know not like three dollars or something you know right. um it's like the two songs that you would you know the two dollars you would spend on mm -hmm. iTunes and that's a dollar just to cover the cost of the right of the cassette and and to be honest like when I started doing it I was like oh this would be really cool we're gonna I just did like a hundred cassettes um after I did like a couple dozen I was like fuck did I do this for you know I was like so labor intensive of like burnt like copying all these cassettes and cutting out these covers and pasting them and like mm -hmm. um so yeah for a dollar right. but 20 um, 30 years from now you know that one dollar cassette 
Maybe, yeah. It'll be worth <laughs> Five dollars. <laughs> but anyway, it was. I just love doing that. Um, yeah, I love uh, what people are doing. So mm. again, Paul from Teeth Like Swords, he runs a really great label called Tor Johnson, and they do a ton of like really cool printings. And he'll he personally like will do like a single side LP, and then the back side is like screen printed, and mm. um, oh, okay. I just love what he's doing. So. And he's kind of focused on that. He's he's really focused on on record shops as well, which is um, an interesting thing for me because, uh, like probably a lot of people, I, I buy music directly from the artist now through Bandcamp or directly from the record label. Mm -hmm. um, you know, part of that is I don't really yeah venture out too much, um, but. Um, even going back, I would usually just wait to buy records at the shows or anything right. like that. But Paul is like really wants people to go into record <clears throat> shops. So he does like limited pressings, and there's like um, so uh, like aneurysms record that just came out, uh, which is really good. Um, is like there's five copies of like green vinyl at Armageddon, and then there's like seven copies of like whatever. I'm just picking colors so don't like quote me on this stuff if you show up there and there's like no green vinyl at Armageddon but like um, right you know seven copies of this other color vinyl at like an independent record shop in New York City and then there's like you know hmm. just different things and he just wants people to go to the record shops he would prefer them to go to these record shops than to um, even buy it directly from Tor Johnson yeah. so um, huh. it's just it's really uh, it's really cool that's a great idea I mean it, from from his perspective, I mean, it sounds kind of like weird to me. Like, I understand why he would want to do that, just to kind of get people into the store. So it's just like it's a mutual support thing. Because if you're yeah. running a label, obviously yeah. you want to you want the record uh, distributors to to want to carry your stuff, and then you know give them an incentive to want to carry it. So it's like, oh, we're gonna have some limited no edition things, and mm -hmm. the limited edition series of vinyl thing is, seems to be the most. Uh, The most like kind of grabbing uh, concept behind the vinyl resurgence lately, I think. I feel like that's like where the efforts are, you know, just like because I think vinyl sounds great, I really do. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think that it matters if it's black vinyl or not, but there are so many more bands and labels that are like making an effort to do these limited pressings to, to kind of, I don't know, just capture that market on like this, this. This collectible yeah thing. well there's like yeah the incentive people kind of respond to the rarity of stuff so if you can put that um, yeah into, into as many right. categories as possible of like maybe because it makes it easier to identify too because so for for me for doing this whole resale record resale business yes yeah. I've been running into the like uh, first pressing records a lot yeah yeah and they're not necessarily unique I mean, it's it's same. It looks it's like, like the same. Looking, yeah, yeah. I mean, like getting back to yeah, like the '60s and stuff like that. When yeah. Looking at those records, it's like what the label is and like the you know the font of the you know the the record label that's on there. So if it still says like Capitol Records, you know, the first pressing is gonna be in like this particular style right. or like this particular like ink color. You know, this one's like right. gray, and the second pressing is black or something right. like that. And you're like, you just need to need to know that yeah um, so I've been like really fortunate to be on the board of the Rhode Island Music Hall of Fame um, uh, be a founding member of the Rhode Island Music Hall of Fame so just getting to know some of the people there and our archivist is this guy Rick Belair that is like the well, one of the most wonderful but also one of the most like brilliant musical minds I've ever encountered mm -hmm. and he has um, do you remember uh, Marty's house in Buffalo did you yeah. Yeah. Because remember his record collection? Well, yeah, I remember it looking massive. Yeah, well, like, Rick, uh, like, surpasses that. Like, Rick's, uh, has a, has a triple-decker, and his second floor is his record collection. That is, <laughs> um, so he's been collecting records of everyone. Like, he's got, like, um, just so much, like, he's a big Beatles fan, big Rolling Stones fan. 
and so he's got yeah like every pressing of every Beatles album. Mm -hmm. uh, but he's been collecting Jesus. Um, records of Rhode Island bands um, for the music archive. So oh. um, so it's been cool. You know, like some bands have been donating to that, uh, which has been uh, has been great. But yeah, he will educate me on all these different things of like how you can tell what the different pressing is of this particular oh, you know yeah. of like a rubber soul you can look at it and be like this is the you know <laughs> this is the third pressing of it or something like that or yeah. this was like the UK import of you know whatever and there's like nothing that I could ever tell but you can just you know right yeah there's very it. very <laughs> like insignificant th yeah. things yeah. or differences and then I, I know what you mean uh, and that I can't recall that stuff like from, from nowhere, but uh, but I have to do the research. Like I'll, yeah. I'll grab the record, knowing uh, like I'll sometimes eyeball it. Like mm -hmm. if I see something and be like, I think that's an earlier one. I'm I'll go ahead and I'll take I'll pick it up and I'll bring it home. Yeah, because I'm like you know worst case scenario like I can I you know break even on it. Mm -hmm. um, but best case scenario is like that's a few hundred dollars right there. Yeah, you know so it's like I'll just bring it home whatever and I'll do the research and I'll look it up and yeah sometimes you win sometimes you lose. Yeah, no big deal. But no, I mean, they've made it a lot easier for people like you now on labels like Top Shelf Records or mm. anyone where they're like, all right, first pressing, you know, 75 were clear, you know, 100 were black, you know, yeah. like 150 were yellow or something like that, second pressing. So you can just tell, you open the thing up and be like, oh, yeah, right. I've got a yellow one, so it must be, yeah. you know, first pressing. Yeah. You know, like, unless they get years down the road and they happen to like redo that. Yeah. But it doesn't even, at least the, the labels that I'm most familiar with or the bands that I'm most familiar with, it doesn't seem like they purposely don't, they don't do another yellow. They do like a, or if they do, it's like a yellow splatter or something like that or, a, right. you know, yellow blue swirl or something, you know, yeah. so you can still kind of differentiate what. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you, you can really hear that swirl. Yeah. Yeah, it's really important. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I dig that stuff. I guess. I mean, it's just no. I do too. I mean, it, it looks cool. It's just an amazing looking thing. I mean, vinyl just yeah. it, just vinyl itself. Yeah. When, it, when it's good, clean copy. Yeah. Looks cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so when you get the different colors and like the splatters and like the um, the marbled look. Like, yeah. It's all cool. cool stuff. And then I mean, um, I have some converged vinyl. That's some of it's like really cool. I mean, they make it like. I mean, they can take it like to the next level, make it like thematic, so it's like it's not red, it's blood splatter, you know. <laughs> um, but you know, I, the thing I love about well, not the thing, but one of the things I love about Converge is like their rarest records are black, you know. Like they're those guys that will just be like, oh, we've got all these like crazy colors, but like if you want to be like the real, it's like we only made fifty on black vinyl or something like that. So yeah. it's like. Like just kind of flipping everything on its head. Um, oh, that's cool. So, um, yeah, a lot of different different ways to kind of go about the rarity stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just, it's just getting getting to be more and more freaking crazy. That's all. All these different pressings. But and I mean, it has like to be this. well. It has to be hard. I mean, I know it is. It's not even a question, or it's, it's, you know, I know it's hard for. Uh, for bands and um, you know the quote-unquote successful bands in order for them to be able to make a living uh, where before they could put out a new record and then kind of bank on the uh, the royalties and just the amount that's going to be sold like the money is in touring so even bands like Wilco who are you know on a major label very influential bands you know one of the you know most well-known bands of our time right now um, right. they don't really make at least from what I've heard they really don't make any money from the record sales like yeah right right because people don't buy records you know like right. um, with places like Spotify and um, just other like streaming services they don't they don't make any money you know unless one of those songs gets on some like coffee house Starbucks uh, yeah, the, like the, playlist that is like you know played you know millions of times a day and that's the only way that like you can make anything substantial from it but right um, no I know it's a, the licensing that's where the money is in, in making yeah. music today I mean probably 
since the, the beginning of, of the re recording industry. But, uh, but yeah, that, so much, even more so today, especially. And yeah. Like, and like all these famous act acts like that, like that's where they make their money. It's just like, oh, we can get our mu music, you know, used in commercials and yeah. movies yeah. and TV. That's like. Yeah. Right. Even, I mean, Sunny Day, they, they're, I think they have a, <coughs> I would say probably like a platinum record. Um, but it's because they have a song on a, one of the Batman movies, I think it is. Oh, the yeah. one that has like Seal. Like, Batman Forever. Is that like what that. it is or something? Like, yeah, so they have it was actually of, uh, one of the tracks on this. Is it, yeah, okay. So, so they, have, they have, you know, that's where their, their platinum or gold record or whatever it is, yeah. you know, like but it's for, from that. For having you know, one song for on one, that Yes, record. exactly. Yeah. You know, it's just like. They don't get that much for that. Like that's not gonna happen. Like if they were yeah. continuing on and keep on like making more music and like got more songs on more records and more, more soundtracks and stuff like that. Yeah. Then, you know, probably be working out pretty well for them. But yeah. Yeah. I actually, I was listening to some. Which I think William was gonna sell too. Now that I think of it, now that he was like, <laughs> he just yeah. didn't care. He's like, if I was gonna, you know, anybody want this thing? Anybody care about having a platinum record? <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. There's probably a market for it. Yeah.